Greetings, friends. It's Michael Parker, and welcome back. We have a brand new episode, and I'm very excited about this. We're going to talk about culture. In 1985, Tina Turner sang, We Don't Need Another Hero, in a movie about heroes, or anti-heroes, if you want to be technical. In 2008, Harvey Dent tells Bruce Wayne, in Dark Knight, you either die a hero or you live long enough to see yourself become the villain. Today's subject is on the role of the hero and how it has changed in the last few decades. Why are heroes portrayed the way they are? Have they evolved? Have they devolved? What is the state of the hero? And what does it say about us as an audience and about the people who create the content? My guest today is Gary Warren. He is an Emmy-nominated reality television producer and writer. He has credits like 1,000 Pound Sister, Dr. Pimple Popper, Seven Little Johnsons, Bering Sea Gold, many others. He's also an indie filmmaker. He has a YouTube channel, which is Mr. Charisma 91. Love that name. His show is Gary Talks, where he discusses television and pop culture. Gary, welcome to the show. Oh, thanks for having me, man. It's good to be here. I am glad to see you. So let's well, let's talk about this. Because you do all of these top tips, you've got quite a few on sitcoms from the 70s and 80s. You've got on wrestling, on action films, many of the things that are just really fun aspects of culture in the late 20th century and the beginning of the 21st century. And I thought you'd be a perfect person to talk to about the hero and how it's portrayed currently. So let's just roll with that. Let's start in the 80s with action heroes and just talk about your thoughts about what's happened to the hero from the 80s until now. Yeah, you know, I mean, in the 80s, you can really sum it up with Schwarzenegger and Stallone. You know, those guys in the 80s, they were your superheroes. I mean, you know, if you want to go a little bit further with pro wrestling, you had your Hulk Hogan's too, right? So you have people who at the time were what we, you know, what what's the best version of ourselves we can be? Oh, here's this muscular guy, takes nothing from anybody gets all the pretty girls, beats up all the bad guys, gets to say some funny lines. And especially for those of us growing up in that time, it was something to look up to. It was like, this is, you know, masculinity. There's nothing more masculine than Schwarzenegger in his Speedo with, <laughs> carrying a gun that shoots 95,000 bullets, you know, while he's rowing his oars with the, the paint on his face in Commando. It's like, that is an action movie hero. And somewhere along the line, that changed. And we could say, was it Bruce Willis with Die Hard, who was kind of the everyman hero? Was it Keanu Reeves in Matrix? You know, at, at what point did it change to now suddenly where if you do have a muscle-bound hero in a movie, he is the comedy, he's the joke. Dave Batista on Guardians of the Galaxy. In 1984, Batista would have been Star-Lord. And now, you know, he's, which, I mean, I love these movies, don't get me wrong, but it is a definite change of pace from the hero that we grew up with. I think about Stallone in the Rocky films, and was that an action film? Well, it was a dramatic piece, but he was, he was a hero on the hero's journey, and you looked up to that, and you admired his, his stick to and his, his depth of character that he wanted this thing and he went out and got it. And he was a good guy. And yes, you're right. It's, when we look at the eighties and we look at these, these people that were the major action figures or actors of that day. Now you use the word masculinity brother. And I think that's part of the secret. Now they would be called, you know, toxic. That's called toxic masculinity. If you ask me what toxic, toxic masculinity would be is, you know, those William Zabka characters from eighties movies. You know, the blonde bully, the guy that's picking on Daniel LaRusso or picking on uh, Rodney Dangerfield's son and back to school. You know, that was the toxic guy, the bad guy, the one that everyone knew, oh, bullies are bad. And somewhere along the way, it became, oh, no, if you're if you're confident as a hero, then you're also toxic. My daughters are both in college now, but. When they were children and they were watching all the shows on Nickelodeon, whatever the channels were at the time, what I noticed was a theme over and over. And I used to kind of complain about it. And now I've seen it echoed by many others, but it was after the fact. When I was watching, because this is not just heroes, but the male character, the father, typically in many of these shows that my daughters were watching, it always followed the same formula, which is the dad is a complete putz, total mm -hmm. nerd. The mom is almost in competition with the daughter. 
the brother is just kind of an annoying nerd. And the teenage daughter was the one who was the brains of the outfit. And I'm not trying to criticize and sound like an old man, but I did notice it over and over to the point that I thought, well, wait a minute, is this lazy creative juices or is there an agenda here? I don't know. I mean, I have my thoughts, but in in general, the role of the hero, which oftentimes was a male for decades and throughout literature, but not always, but for the most part, was a male. And now I'm seeing a concerted move to make it a female, which is not a bad thing, but it's just, to me, it's done so much that it's it's a bit tiresome. That said, are you have you watched this new show, Fallout? I just started watching it, which I'm a Walton Goggins fan. Like, I love the guy. Uh, yeah. If I have to have a man crush, he's my man crush. But, you know, what I do, because I, I hate streaming, I hate the binge watch, I mm -hmm. force myself to watch once a week. So Friday night is uh, Sci-Fi Friday for my wife and I. So we always watch Sci-Fi TV shows, and we just watch one a week. So we just started Fallout. So it'll be eight weeks or so before I catch up to the rest of everybody else. It is very interesting that you say that because I just read an article today about, I, I've already watched the whole thing. I'm not going to give away any spoilers, but the article was, it's a great show, and but Amazon made one mistake. And that was that they released all the episodes at the same time instead of dropping it on a weekly basis to continue people talking around the water cooler about it. Yeah, that was what, you know, a show like Lost the what was probably better than the show itself and what people today that that were watching it can gather we would watch it we would get on the internet we would talk about every single fan theory people were dissecting line by line what does this mean what does that mean which in one hand is probably why a lot of us were disappointed with the finale because yep. we had spent far more hours working on it than probably the writing team had but it also made a sense of community that you lose now i mean when house of cards was one of the first shows to drop as a binge. And then I felt forced to watch it all in one night or it'd get spoiled. Because invariably, somebody at work, you'd overhear them talking about, oh, so-and-so did this and so-and-so did that. And uh, now I just decide not to listen to what anyone says. And I'm watching one per week, regardless, keeping, keeping the old school TV alive. Yeah, that's interesting to me. I mean, I, I had not really thought about that until I read that article, and now I hear you echoing it. And actually, that makes a lot of sense to me. I was a big Game of Thrones guy when when it was happening, and, and Sopranos, and House of Cards as well. And I don't watch a great deal of TV, but those were the things the wife and I, we would sit down together, and it was our, our viewing experience together, and we did look forward to it. Every, every week, whatever the the night was those shows were on, we looked forward to that experience together. So there is something to be said for that. The reason that I brought up Fallout is because, again, and I liked the show generally, but in this particular case, the hero is a young woman, which is cool. The, the men, though, are all like these total dweebs, and they're kind of feckless bureaucrats, and they're kind of silly, and they don't have a lot of guts. The one guy who has guts is the is this person who's the ghoul. Yeah. And I'm not going to give away too much about the guy. I would put him kind of in the anti-hero class because he has some redeeming characters that you see in his backstory. He didn't start out the way he became, but my only reserve about the show was like, wait a minute, so we're going to go down this road again where this is the way the hero lays out and et cetera. But you will enjoy the show. It is, it is a fun show. And I did ultimately enjoy it. Well, you know, I think going back to what you were talking about, you know, the sitcoms that your daughters were watching, I don't really know what would be the first show that was a hit with that format. Because if you look at Family Ties in the 80s or whatever, you had Michael J. Fox was, was your hero, was your star, you know, the young guy, your growing pains, Kurt Cameron was the guy. It definitely did start changing where maybe Full House, where the daughters were the ones of the dad, you know, the, parent, the parents were kind of goofy or whatever. And I don't necessarily think that it was a conscious decision to make this some sort of theme that would resonate for a generation. But I think all it comes from is the laziness of networks. So I think one show was a hit with the dumb dad, the mom in competition with the daughter, the stupid nerd little brother. 
Everyone said, give me that version of the show. And unwittingly, they made what became the new norm. And people don't like to admit it, but television and movies do shape people's tastes, people's thoughts. Absolutely. And either un- unwittingly or not. You know, I, I doubt there was some guy in a boardroom that was like, 30 years from now, we're going to make men not be masculine anymore by this. But I think it, it comes from lack of originality and it just snowballs over time. Well, the lack of originality point did come to my mind. I just saw it so much. I, and and with, the, with the culture wars and the way people talk about things now, I was like, okay, this could just be laziness in the creative department. I don't entirely feel it's always that way, though. I think there is a bit of an agenda, but I'm not saying it oh, is sure. that way. I'm not saying it is that way all the time, but is there anything else that you're watching right now that you're really loving that there are a protagonist or hero in that's being portrayed more traditionally? I don't know if you've watched Shogun. I haven't Hulu. yet. It's it's really good. And it's it's pretty fair. You know, it's, it's a remake of the, the show from the 70s, the miniseries from the 70s and the book. They really are working hard to be more fair to the Japanese culture and that sort of thing. But you still have these kind of traditional heroes, while at the same time, you've got strong female characters. So there's a really good balance to it where you don't feel this is really heavy handed, that it's preachy. And so far, it's it's a really well done show. I'd highly recommend that. I am glad to hear that. Well, that gives me and the wife something new to watch. Well, in the uh, theaters this weekend, the, the movie that made the most money, $26 million, was a film called Civil War. And this was directed by Alex Garland. And he had made Ex Machina, which I really, really liked. I saw it when it came out. His next film, Annihilation, I didn't like quite as much. I'm a sci-fi geek as well. The third film he made, I think it's called Men. I have not seen that. It's but horrible. This, is horrible. it? Yeah. Okay. So this film, when I heard about it, I'm like, do we really need this as if we need any further kind of polarization of the audience? However, I have since read many reviews and seen people talk about it on YouTube. And what was interesting about it to me is that people have been upset with the film that in the film, they're not explaining why this particular war is happening in the film. Basically America has a civil war and they had this civil war because apparently there is a bad president who's going to disband the FBI so that he can have a third term. And then I mean, I know, right. And, but so now I'm actually somewhat interested. Do you have any thoughts on the civil war film uh, and phenomena? I haven't seen it. Uh, I do find it really interesting that before the movie came out, it seemed like our friends on the liberal side were jonesing to see it. They couldn't wait to see it because all the MAGA people are going to be like crushed under the boot heels of, you know, a woke ideology. All our conservative friends were like, I'm not paying money to see a movie that is, you know, making fun of me, making fun of my beliefs. I get enough of that just watching regular movies. And then what it sounds like is that it's, straight down the middle. It's more about just being a, like a photographer at wartime. Yes. And it just so happens that the war is here in a civil war. And the our liberal friends are upset because they didn't see the movie they wanted to see. Right. What's interesting to me about it, and this is my whole theme about heroes and the changing face of the hero, and maybe I'm riffing overly poetic and romanticizing something, but to me, oftentimes, the heroes in many movies and pop culture were a metaphor for America and the shining beacon on the hill doing the right thing and being a hero. And now in this film, the American people are not heroes. In fact, they're villains essentially. Now it's not specified as to who's worse than the other, but I mean, there's, there's some pretty self-interpretive depictions of what's going on there. The one thing I do like about the film, and I will watch it, is the general expression of the fact that war is hell, and you do not want to indulge in it unless you have no other alternative. So I'm going to give Alex Garland points on that end. Uh, You know, one of my issues with Alex Garland is that I feel like his thoughts and his themes are, they're really smart. He's really shooting for the stars. And I think he very rarely reaches it. 
I think the ideas for his movies are better than the movie turns out to be. And it's hard to know is that through executives interference at studios, whatever, I, I kind of think it might be because when someone's very first movie is as good as his first movie and everything afterwards isn't, it feels like only a couple things have happened. One, they're rich and famous and not hungry and they can't relate. Or now they have interference from the money people, which I would gather is probably part of what's going on. Interesting. When I saw Ex Machina, I saw it for free. I saw it here in Hollywood. I was donating money to a particular radio station at that point in time. And that was one of their treats that they gave to people. So I got to see it for free. But at the time, I really enjoyed it. I thought it was quite clever. And I thought it was on the cusp of the whole transhumanism kind of AI thing. So I liked that. And then Annihilation, again, I saw it at home. And it, and it, was, it wasn't as great. So I don't know. When I watch this, I will, again, probably wait till it comes out on a streaming service and see it for free at home. I think what like part of the time too, the, the negative about waiting for movies, like a lot of times we do, is it's hard to not become influenced by word of mouth. True. So it either comes, oh my God, like Annihilation is the greatest movie I've ever seen. I heard so many people say how great it was. By the really? time I saw it at home, I was like, it's not all that. No. Or then another movie that people are like, oh, that movie sucks. It's horrible. It's horrible. And you watch it and you're like, eh, it wasn't that horrible. I had a good right. time. So I think that you know, that is the the flip side of waiting to see something is that it's hard to not be influenced one way or the other. It's funny because when Annihilation came out, and I don't even know when that was, I just know it was the second film. I don't even know if I knew about it because one time when my wife and I finally watched it, I was just searching through the channels trying to find something to watch. And it was a sci-fi film that I haven't seen, so I watch it. I didn't even remember that there was a buzz about it, but I'm sure there was at the time. Yeah, I think it was on a lot of top 10 lists. I think it really? was like a lot of people's top movie of the year. I seem to remember that people were thinking that it would get some Oscar noms, and I don't think it did, justifiably so, because I didn't, I didn't feel it to be an Oscar-caliber movie. Although, you know, with the Oscars, there's what is an Oscar-caliber movie? That's a whole other episode we could do. Mm -hmm. Well, while we're talking about the streaming channels, and heroes and just the changing face of what we celebrate or what we look up to. Emma Stone just won an Oscar for this movie, Poor Things, Best Actress. And the other night, we were looking for something to watch. And we're like, well, let's watch the Poor Things film. So we are looking on Apple TV. How are we going to watch it? Holy cow. It's on Disney? Disney Plus? And listen. I am not a prude, man. But after watching this film, I thought, you got to be kidding me. And I know that people will say that this was done through their integration with Hulu. But the film is essentially about a woman who is reanimated. And she then goes on a journey of self-discovery. She... Well, let me say what I like about the film. I like the way the film looked. The cinematography, I really enjoyed. I love William Defoe. Wasn't super crazy about him in this film, but um, I'm a fan generally. In this film, this reanimated person goes through the stages of uh, being an infant, child, adult, all within the body of an adult. So she discovers masturbation, has a lot of sex, eventually becomes a prostitute. And this is all in a film that is on the landing page for Disney+. Plus. Your thoughts? Well, I think first of all, it doesn't make you a prude that this kind of thing shocks you when you've discovered it through Disney Plus. I think that we have kind of triggers in our mind where we expect based on what we're going to watch. If we're going to watch something on PBS, we expect it to have some sort of like, uh, you know, smartness to it or something like, oh, oh, this documentary on PBS. I think if we watch something on Comedy Central, we're like, okay, this is going to be funny. If we watch something on Disney Plus, we have our mindset of like, okay, at the most, you know, this thing's going to be, you know, PG level. So I think even if you enjoy any sort of like nudity, sex and movies or whatever, when you come at it through the Disney gaze in your mind, you're shocked and it makes it shocking. So I think first of all that, and I'm shocked that you saw it on that. I remember watching it on Hulu and I did not like the movie at all. And I think- I didn't really care for it that, that much. There- there is something creepy about the movie. 
Because yes, as she does age in the body of the woman, it's not like we've got a Chiron that says, oh, she's now 16. Oh, she's now 26. Now she's 30. So we don't know what age this is when Mark Ruffalo's character is showing up to have sex with her. True. We don't know. So it could be that she's still 12. You know, you don't know. There, there's kind of a creepy factor to it. But then when you add that to Disney, it brings the creepy level up to like a thousand. And I'm just thinking if I am one of the shareholders for Disney or I'm one of the guys in the board and I'm thinking, listen, I know they already have some superhero films on there that have some pretty intense violence. But this is a completely different thing. This is, and it's, I'm not just talking two, three, four, five, six sex scenes. There's, there's many sex scenes. So, I mean, it is a sex laden film, and, and it's I really it, it. It has a, a vibe to it, you know, almost in that Tim Burton atmosphere. Yes. So it almost is shot in a fanciful, cartoonish almost way, right? So if you are young and you stumble across it this would not feel like if you're a little kid and you start watching platoon you're going to turn it like this is boring i don't get it you're going to turn it off if if you're a little kid and you come across this there's enough hallmarks of it that register like oh this could be a willy wonka sequel and then suddenly you know all this other stuff that willy wonka never had in his chocolate factory comes true well that is precisely my my point and I can foresee someone getting really bent out of shape about this. Oh, my God, I just walked in on my kids who are watching Disney+. Plus. Now, listen, parents should be overseeing what their kids watch. No question about that. So that's true. However, how often does that happen? Right. And, 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 and a person is on this channel, a kid is on this channel, and they want to watch this movie, which looks interesting. And next thing you know, it's all about this. I think, I don't know, I think it's a weird choice to make for Disney. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, I don't I don't have little kids. I've never had little kids, but I know that a lot of the streamers have options on it where you can like click adult entertainment or, or adult themes or whatever are blocked. It probably wouldn't occur to even the most helicopter parent that they need to turn that on on Disney. Yeah. You would just assume that the worst thing we'll see on Disney is old Yeller gets shot. Spoiler. You know, so you're probably not thinking because I mean, remember when Splash came out? And I believe 86. And that was going to be a Disney movie. And because Daryl Hannah was topless, they created Touchstone Pictures so that it was separate from the Disney label so that parents and children wouldn't be confused and see something they didn't want to see. So it feels like it's almost a reversal of that to now incorporate all this onto the same streaming platform. The story itself was kind of ugly to me, actually. And again, all the men are complete idiots or they're really troubled in some way or the other. And the protagonist is, is this, is this woman that Emma, Emma Stone portrays. Anyway, I didn't have a good feeling of it, but the idea that it was on Disney plus was, um, I don't know. I think that was a tactical mistake. And when I look at pop culture today and what is trending versus what might've been trending when we were younger, I can't help but feel that there are certain things that are being displayed over and over with a certain type of messaging. I'm not saying that's intentionally what happened in that film, but it is weird. And especially when you then take that film and put it on Disney, where you're putting it on a Hulu, which is integrated with Disney. So it shows up on the Disney landing page. I don't know. I just didn't like it. Yeah. I mean, at, at best, it's someone was just not paying attention to what they were programming. At worst is a much darker and deeper issue that I think we just have to hope wasn't the case. And it was just someone wasn't thinking and someone hit one zero one one zero one or whatever on their programming pad and put it on Disney. But this should be something that there are consequences of some sort so that this doesn't happen again. I agree. And we're going to change gears a little bit because I am talking about themes. But another thing that I was thinking about for guys like you and I, we're very heavily invested in the entertainment complex and watching things change. And there's the technological changes. I was working in the music business when we went from vinyl to CDs. And then when we went from CDs to streaming culture and 
that's when I moved into new media. But was what was interesting at the time was the record companies did not really want to seem to deal with the fact that this oncoming train was coming. And that was Napster and streaming. And now we see what's changed. And then with television and film, we've had this move away from DVDs and the, the, the consoles that played them. Now everything's streaming. You can watch all this stuff on the super, supercomputer that's in your pocket. I don't know if there are other technological changes in the future that would change the landscape of entertainment. VR hasn't really seemed to take off to the level that some people thought it would. And even then, you still have to watch it through some kind of gear. But I think these technological changes, shocks to the system, are over. Do you foresee anything coming in the future that would be changes like this again that the industries would have to deal with? I think so. But, but right before I say that, let me say that I love physical media. I will never mm -hmm. give up on physical media. I collect DVDs, Blu-rays. I have a, a library in my house with like 20,000 different Blu-rays and DVDs only because streamers can decide not to show something. The French Connection was censored last year uh, because Popeye Doyle says some racist things and whoever was hosting these things, they didn't want their hero being a racist. So they censored and altered the movie. So only if you have physical copies of these things, or if you have your own downloads on your own hard drive, not on a cloud, uh, they can be taken away from you at any time. They can tell you what you can and can't listen to or watch. So physical media forever. But as far as what I think the next technological breakthrough is going to be, I don't think it's going to be by format. I think it's going to be AI. I think AI at one point, probably in our lifetimes, you're going to be able to tell some AI what movie you want to see, and it will instantaneously, instantaneously show you that movie. I can say, I want to see a new Star Wars movie where Han Solo and Chewbacca go on an adventure and travel through time and end up meeting Marty McFly. And the AI program will do that and will make it and it will seem real. I think that's going to be in the next 20 years, what the future of entertainment is going to be. I don't think it's going to be a new 8K, you know, projector or anything, because what can we do better than having, you know, every movie in the world in the palm of our hand? So I think it's going to be the what the movies are made of and how they're made. That's going to be the next jump. Well, that absolutely makes sense to me. And I have seen in some cases where, and I don't know if I'm saying this man's name correctly, Jodorowsky. From, from the 70s, he was going to try to make a version of Dune and people like, I think, Mick Jagger and all these people were going to be involved with it. It never happened. Yeah. However, I have seen on the net people who've made AI created versions of what they want. They thought that film might have looked like. So in a sense, what you're describing, I think, has already happened on a small level. It has. And, you know, actors like Bruce Willis, who before a lot of his health problems, he sold his likeness to be used as AI so they can make a new Die Hard movie with a young John McClane. But the way that we see musicians sell their catalog, yeah. they get a little older and it's like, oh yeah, I'll, I'll cash out, make another $700 million on my old songs, let somebody else do it. I think actors are going to start doing that. Your Harrison Fords, your Helen Mirrens, you know, pretty much everyone is going to end up selling their likeness for millions of dollars and then the AI and the studios will legally be able to make a new Indiana Jones with a young Harrison Ford. And I think, I think that's the step we'll see in five years. And then I think within 20, it'll be consumer-based. You tell them what you want to see, and they deliver the movie that you personally want. Well, wasn't the AI aspect part of the, uh, the strike last year, like what was going to happen with AI in the SAG after strike, I think? That was one of the big things. And they did agree to, to a, a few things here and there. A lot of background actors was one of the big problems because they want to use AI to become all the extras. Yeah. And But one of the things they were trying to do was make it, if you were an extra in one show, the show owned your likeness forever. So you got paid your you know $96 for your day at Central Casting. And then suddenly you're now in every episode of Law & Order and you never see another dollar. So those were some of the things that they were striking on. But, you know, it seems like from from everyone in SAG, most people aren't happy with the agreement that happened. And I don't think it protected people's rights enough from AI. 
And I think even eventually people will, will be paid for what AI does, but they won't be actually working anymore. The AI thing is interesting. I have tried some of the AI music creation platforms just out of curiosity to see what is possible so that I could talk about it. I still make music and and it has there's it always sounds really weird to me actually and I know that it will get better and I'm sure it will get eerily better but right now the platforms that I have used to make music through AI have a very strange vibe to it yeah, there's still a, a non-human quality. It's the same yes. as when you see this, oh, here's an AI image of what Kurt Cobain would look like today. Here's what John Lennon would look like today. And it's missing the soul in the eyes. You know what I mean? It, it has that Terminator feel where it's like it looks like a person, but it's not a person. But I think that's something that will change. I mean, there, there are programs, my wife is a photographer. There are AI programs already that, basically will learn they, they will learn what you like to do for editing for your pictures you upload your raw files it'll do a first pass and like here you go and then you're like oh yeah that does look like mine i might like a little more green here or i want to take this ugly guy out of the background or whatever but it's already there for tv and film editing there are programs that will immediately figure out the transcript of everything that was shot. And then all you have to do is type what you almost what you want your script to be, and it will pick the shots for you. And then you have to go back over and make changes, you know, things like that. But I think it's coming fast. And I, you know, I don't know if AI is going to, you know, take over the world and, and be human destruction like in the movies. Although I also can't say that won't happen. Right. I, I do think it is going to be a huge change in pop culture of all sorts. I mean, you know, it'll be, have you heard these, these things? It's like, oh, what would happen if Elvis saying smells like teen spirit? Yes. It'll be the AI version of that. And it's, it's not quite right. But, right. you know, how is in five years any young up and coming artist going to be better than, hey, I'd li love to hear Led Zeppelin do w whatever song or in it sounds just like Led Zeppelin or you want to hear, you know, I, I want a new Kiss song with Paul and Gene and it gives it to you. Gary, you're reading my mind because that was exactly where I was going to go next. I was actually going to use Led Zeppelin and Kiss and Van Halen and David <laughs> Bowie. Same page, as, man. As, 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 as my points of interest, because back on the, the riff about heroes, when I was growing up, and I'm older than you, but it was the same for you. Many of my heroes, and still are, were musical heroes. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And like you look at Led Zeppelin, this is a towering towering monolith and very compelling human beings. Now let's counter that with to, when this comes out tomorrow, the next day, it will be right before the second week of Coachella. So my point is, as we talk about changing culture and I look at Coachella and I'm a music fanatic and music does not carry, I think, its place within the pop culture or cultural spectrum that it did in the 50s, 60s, 70s, even up through the 90s. I love grunge, man. I was like, I was, I was all in on grunge. After that, I've, I, I still listen to music all the time. I work in the music business. I, I, I was a buyer for Virgin. I, I bought all their world music. I bought all their country music. I, I've done a lot. I've worked for jazz labels, so I'm not a one-trick pony when it comes to music. And that's this question that keeps coming through, you know, just music suck now, or are we just old? Well, I have very definite opinions on that, but what's interesting is what people have said about Coachella. Have you read any of the, uh, about any of the stuff that just happened at Coachella? I did. The, the one that really jumped out at me is the, the Blur set. That yes. Blur is doing their first show in America, and I don't even know how long, you know, 15 years, I don't know. And the audience didn't care to the point that, you know, the lead singer is like calling up the audience, you know, like, I'm, we're not doing this song again. So, you know, and, and they, the audience was more concerned with selfies and tag, you know, posting that they were at Coachella than really being at Coachella. Well, I think that that is what Coachella is now. I've heard people call it the influencer Olympics. And I'll be honest at this point, a lot of the people that play it, Coachella, in my opinion, are kind of just influencers. 
And I think that there's reasons for that. David Auburn of Blur, you're right. He said those things. And the same thing happened when the Stone Roses played a few years ago. And these were bands, the Stone Roses from the late 80s. I Blur love from the Roses. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Blur from the Britpop early to mid 90s. These are great bands, but nobody cares. Yeah. And I do not blame them for taking the gig. But it's unfortunate that the reception of these bands was such. And when I look at when the Coachella list of artists comes out, I'm always like, my God, there's 100 bands on here, of which literally there's probably less than a handful that I would have any interest in seeing. And it's just interesting to me because the things that people now look up to, to me, are rather diminutive. And I don't really get it. And when people say, is music worse now or better? I still think that there is great music being made. I don't think that that's the music that's being pushed. Yeah. I mean, I think, first of all, the lack of radio is a huge, a huge change in it. You know, when we were growing up, the radio DJ was a god, right? This voice that was like, I'm going to play, I'm going to play the new Metallica in two hours. But first, you know, you sat there waiting like, oh, my God, I can't wait to hear it. He has the yeah. power to play it. Yeah. You know, the DJ could make or break a band. You hear so many stories of some band that's huge now that couldn't get airplay. And then some guy in Detroit started playing the record or they'd flip the A side over, play the B side. The B side became the hit, you know, and you had that same as we talked about with television, where people had the groundswell of discussing things. Oh, have you heard this song? Have you heard this song? Oh, no, but you got to listen to the radio station. They're going to play it again. They're doing the top 10 songs and it would grow. And there was a community to music. I think now with your Spotify's, with your streaming, with everything where you're basically in control of whatever you want to hear, A, it makes it harder to be introduced to new music because we don't have that, you know, gatekeeper almost, so to speak, that is introducing us to new things. And then we we also just get stuck in our ways where it's like, oh, you know, oh, you like Living Color? Here are six bands like them, but they're all bands from the same decade. They're not playing a new band that has that same vibe. I just saw Living Color about a month ago. They were opening for Extreme. And um, yeah. one of my buddies was like, hey, Parker, let's go see Extreme. I'm like, Living Color's on the bill? That I'm in. And uh, they were really great. And so I'm not trying to completely drag on Coachella, but I'll be honest, I don't know anybody who goes to Coachella. And I, I really don't. And I don't see that many artists that would be compelling to me. And the thing that really kind of bugs me about it is that pe the joke is that it's the influencer Olympics that really you just go there for the reason that you mentioned, which is to get paid to show off a new tequila or a brand of sunglasses or this, that, and the other. Meanwhile, the music is somewhat secondary. And I think that that is emblematic of the issues that the music industry has now. I've gone to a music festival called Desert Days here in California several different years. It was not held last year or the year before, but it's I've seen really great electronica, punk rock, psychedelia, and it's a much smaller festival, probably less than 20,000 people, but it's the real deal. And people are there for the music and the music's really carefully curated. And so it's, I'm not saying this is not good music. I just think that once again, the algorithm or the programmers or whatever are not oftentimes picking the most compelling music. Well, and I think too, something that's as large as Coachella is a magnifying glass of society. Yes. You can look back at Woodstock, right? Woodstock was the Coachella of the time, except it was every popular band. But what was it about? It was about peace and love and harmony. And that was what the young society was all about. You know, it was a magnifying glass of this is what culture is. Look at Live Aid. Live Aid in the 80s, the same thing, all the bands, but it was like people that were almost rebelling against the status quo of society. Like, no, we need to help, you know, the hungry in Africa. We need to use music to make the world a better place. You know, we are the world and that kind of thing. And that was kind of like people growing up in the 80s. People growing up today is all about being an influencer about this online life that you have that is not real. And I feel that Coachella is, you know, really the magnifying glass of of where society is right now. 
the online life, man. That's good, Gary. That's because that is so true. And it's when I think about different genres of music and the only genre now that I think of still kind of retains that magic and that heartfelt audience that treats it like a religion is probably metal. Yeah. Because that is a full blown lifestyle. I'm actually glad to see country music make the popularity surge that it has, but I'll be honest, it's not really country music, but here again, that's just my opinion, but I am glad to see people actually playing instruments. And when people talk about the quality of music, I think one of that also is the aspect of technology because to make a lot of this type of music on my computer right now, I have hundreds of plugins and I have software platforms that allow me to create pieces of music, if I wish, that is so perfectly quantized that nothing nothing is out of time and nothing is out of tune. Well, guess what? I love the Stones. <laughs> and those guys were not exactly, you know, total harmonizers. And Charlie could swing, but not everything was in time. And so I think a little bit of imperfection sometimes makes it even better. Yeah, I mean, the first Black Sabbath album was made in like, you know, four days or whatever. The first Ramones album they did in like a day. You know, it's like it was live musicians playing and just here's the song. This is how we sound in concert. We're just going to play it live. And, you know, I love your your Mutt Langs, right? Your your producers that go crazy with the production. and make Roy Thomas Baker, who produced Queen. Yeah. Roy Halley that did uh, Simon and Garfunkel was really was kind of crazy in a production for something that was folk, you know, with, with things that you wouldn't think of. So I do appreciate that. Yes. But I feel that the ease to overproduce makes a, our talent doesn't have to be truly talented because the producer can cover everything and that it just makes it harder for the truly talented people that want to be real to stand out. Is there anything movie wise or music wise right now that you're just really excited about that's like pushing your buttons in the right way it's weird i, I was trying to think today you know what what new music do, do i really listen to do i get into and like i'm like oh how about this band oh they've been out 20 years what yes, about this? Oh, they, you know like it, it's weird to me that there, there is a weird maybe everything that came out post-college seems to me like it should be a new band like have you heard of them foo fighters you know, they've been out for like 25 years or they're in the Rocker Hall of Fame, you know. So it's really hard for me to to have a new young band that that really that makes me happy. You know, so many of the, the things I buy, the new Judas Priest is amazing. That's it's what I hear. Albums. Yeah, it's so good. But it's like, well, the band's been out 50 years. You know, yeah. it should be good. Movie wise, two things that I've loved greatly recently that people are going to laugh at or get downright mad. The Roadhouse remake on Amazon Prime is one of the most fun things I have watched. It is so horribly bad that it comes all the way back around again, and I love it. And when I, when I talked about that online, Patrick Swayze fans came after me with pitchforks because somehow they they view the original Roadhouse as, you know, this mecca. Sacred. Movie. Yeah. Which, I, I mean, I always liked that movie, but it was always just kind of a bad Patrick Swayze movie, so I didn't have that love for it. But I loved the Roadhouse remake, and I loved the new Godzilla King Kong movie for almost the same reason of how did this thing get made with this kind of budget, but it is so much fun. And really, at, at this point in my life, with things going on in the world, what I look for in a movie, I don't look to be challenged anymore. I don't look for something to teach me a lesson. I just want to go to the movies and have a good time. And if that happens, then I'm happy. A hundred percent. Are you talking about the new Godzilla Kong thing or the uh, Japanese Godzilla thing? The new Godzilla Kong new empire. Okay. It is. I mean, have you seen it yet? I have not, but I am. Listen, my kids laugh at me when, when Skull Island came out a couple of years ago, I took my daughters and dear. Okay. First of all, who doesn't love Godzilla and King Kong? Come on. And right. then second of all, would you listen to that film? They've got Sabbath. They've got Iggy pop. I mean, like, I'm like, this is the greatest film of that of this year. So last week, my wife and I went to see Sasquatch Sunset, which is that the one with uh, Jesse Eisenberg? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so okay. I've heard of that. So it's actually had a pretty big social media push here. At least it, I mean, it was coming up in my feed all the time. I, I love me some Bigfoot. So I thought, let's go see this. But, and I did enjoy it. Now, I will say that 
We did have a couple of cocktails beforehand. Not a, everybody's going to like this movie because there's no dialogue. There's Sasquatch, and um, and it's and it is an art film. But I enjoyed it because it was it was not preachy. Eh, well, I take that back. There's there's some elements that you could read into it, perhaps. But it it was it was fun. But yeah, I do intend to go see the Godzilla Kong film. Well, you know, in, in that vein of the soundtrack, I won't give anything away. But there is a Kiss song in it. It is a song you wouldn't expect, and it's used in one of the strangest places. That when it happened, I just started clapping because it's like, what the hell am I watching? Was Is it going to be I Was Made for Loving You? That is the song. Dude, what is the deal with that song? I actually like Dynasty, and you did a Kiss thing recently that I really enjoyed. I actually like Dynasty, and I know that I was in the minority, and I actually liked that song, and I still do. But like, it's had a res- it's like ABBA or something in that it had this resurgency of popularity within the popular spectrum, I think because it's kind of so cheesy. Yeah, it, it is kind of strange when those kind of things happen, you know, where it's it's not their big song, but suddenly it's everywhere, which yeah. then, you know, bands start going and playing that. You know, it was almost, and not from the cheese factor, but Master of Puppets from Metallica. You know, it like all the fans love Master of Puppets, but when that song was in Stranger Things, suddenly it's everywhere now. People know it. It's, you know, and and same with the Kate Bush. It's like somehow it gets back in the zeitgeist 20, 30, 40 years later. And who knows why things catch on the way they do. I was at a grocery store just yesterday and I heard I was made for loving you. And it's like, like I say, I'm, I'm, I'm an OG Kiss fan way back in the day. I saw them. But it's just funny, that song is popping up in a lot of different places. But I will try to see the Kong Godzilla. And I do see that what looks like a baby Kong. Uh, not exactly. So basically, uh, spoiler free, but in, in, uh, was it hidden earth, which is the, the realm yes. in the middle of the earth yeah. where Kong has gone. He discovers there are an entire race of, of giant apes, much like him, except they are led by an evil warlike ape who the, the ape graphics, I swear they just stole the hard drive from the planet of the apes movies. Because it looks like the same animations. Like, I, I really wouldn't be surprised if, you know, the old way that Disney would take Baloo from Jungle Book and then put him in the Robin Hood. Yeah. You know, it's, it almost feels like the same thing. Like, I'm pretty sure this bad guy is Koba from the Planet of the Apes movies. Well, it's funny that you say that because there is a brand new Planet of the Apes film out. And the other day, maybe I was on Disney again, because I think Disney has all the Planet of the Apes films. Yeah. And I'm an old school Planet of the Apes guy. I like some of the new films, but I kind of lost interest. And I don't even know where we're at in the franchise at this point. But there is a new Planet of the Apes film. Yeah, this new one is going to be, you know, in, in the reboot trilogy, which I love. I think they're fantastic. This new one, is the, the last one, War of the Planet of the Apes, ended where Caesar dies. But now humans have, have lost their voice. The apes completely have taken over the planet. So the new one is going to be, I believe, like a thousand years in the future. So now Caesar, Caesar has become kind of the God character that we saw in the original Charlton Heston type movie. So he's, you know, he's the Moses that led the apes to freedom. But now we're going to start getting the splintering of the groups where some are the, the orangutans are scientists and the gorillas are warriors, you know, and that yeah. kind of thing. And I think that's where we're seeing. and. I honestly would not be surprised if it ends with a rocket ship crash landing. Interesting. You you use the C word, Charlton Heston. And that's actually a nice way to take this back to the whole thing. When I was a kid and I saw the Omega Man for the first time, I loved it. And then I saw it again at some point during the 2000s because I was doing a... uh, I was doing a whole thing on 70s science fiction, which basically invented the whole dystopian science fiction kind of thing. And in that film, Charlton Heston is this whiskey drinking, bare chested, gun toting, totally toxically masculine guy, but still the hero. I don't know if we'll ever see that again. Well, the problem is when we do see it, he's a laughing stock. He's, or he's the bad guy. He's the bad guy. He's a guy out of time doesn't understand that he needs the 18 year old pretty girl to save him, you know, which, which the first chant, the first thing I ever saw that in, which was done to perfection was big trouble in little China. Mm -hmm. That was the first movie where 
Kurt Russell's character would have been the hero. And in his mind, he was the hero, but he was just kind of a buffoon. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that unknowingly laid the groundwork for where action heroes went, where our typical this is the badass is just out of touch and can't do anything right. And he needs a little kid or a girl or a nerd or, you know, someone else to kind of be the hero while he just lumbers around with his muscles. Well, I would like to say to the creatives out there who make these films, you know, please cut us some slack here. I mean, you don't have to follow the blueprint over and over. And I got to be honest, right? At this point, it's really predictable. Most of these movies, when I watch them, I know exactly what's going to happen. I know exactly why they did something. I love going to see the movie. So I'm not saying the art form is crap. I'm just saying, let's actually think outside of the box. And I will say, Fallout, without giving away any spoilers, is a mixture to me or maybe, you know, I hope I'm not projecting on it, but I see some social criticism in that show. I see it at turns bowing to some of these things that we're talking about and making fun of it at the same time. So it's a very interesting juxtaposition of some of these things I'm bitching and moaning about. Well, you know, and I think considering we're talking about Amazon Prime, something that harkens back to the action star that we've been missing is Reacher which is on Amazon Prime. Yes. You have Alan Richardson, who is just a hulking mammoth 80s action hero, and he's not treated like a joke. You know, he is the star. He is the badass that he needs to be. Yet his team is made up of women and minorities, but it doesn't feel like there's a checklist. You know, and I think that you can definitely have diversity in a movie. You can definitely have strong female characters in a TV show. Clearly, it just has to be done where it's not beating someone over the head at the expense of other characters. Very well said. I think we'll leave it there. I've thoroughly enjoyed this conversation and tell everybody how they can find you on YouTube because you've got some good stuff over there. So Mr. Charisma 91 is my YouTube channel. That was my uh, my college radio name. I had a show called Jack Astry in the morning and I was Mr. Charisma Gary Warren or just go to YouTube and search for Gary Talks. Each Friday, I put up a new show, tomorrow's show, because it's 420 this weekend. I am ranking my top 10 stoner comedies. Nice. Actually, that's a good call. And you are always funny. And I think you're really spot on with your with your commentary on these things, maybe because we're somewhat similar. But I always enjoy your work, Gary. Oh, thanks, man. And thanks for having me on. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, if you like this show, please share it with your friends, your family, your coworkers, whatever. Give me a little like. Give me a little thumbs up. Hit that. Uh, the buttons on whatever platform you're on, because I'm on all of them. And it would really mean a lot to me. This is free. And that's one way that you could really help me. So I enjoy making this content for you. I enjoy talking about the events of the world and the things that I think need to be spoken about. And I appreciate you watching and listening. Ladies and gentlemen, until next time, keep your heart and your mind.